Students' success is always an inspiration for a teacher. Anurag, we are so proud of you. So our esteemed speaker for the next session is Dr. Shondipon Sharkar. Dr. Sh Dr. Shondipon Sharkar is an executive architect serving Community Competence Center of Competence in IBM. In his career spanning over two decades on various technical leadership roles, he was responsible for crafting cutting-edge technical solutions and thought leadership to address integrating business problems. Dr. Sharkar holds a PhD in Computer Science and Engineering from Jadavpur University, India. His research interest lies in computational linguistic, information retrieval, and machine learning. Now I will hand over the session to Dr. Sharkar. To Professor Chandra. Uh, I need a little bit of time to set up my uh, machine over here. Uh, but uh, while I'm doing that, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Chandra. And uh, I can see Professor Kandida over here also. So for inviting me, um, I always enjoy, you know, speaking to colleges because it's, it reminds me of my younger days, of course, right? So, uh, just give me a moment, uh, just to take it up. I recently moved to Mac, and I'm not a big fan of Mac, to be honest. Uh, I'm pretty sure that some of you will disagree with me. Uh, let me see. Silence. Okay. Yeah, give you bear with me, please, guys. I'm kind of um, clumsy with this one. Display. Oh, man. 
utter despair. So thereby, you know, eliminating the need of, you know, having your own country's own intelligence agencies, right? And that put them in direct conflict with, uh, what is that, MI6 or MI5, whatever it is, James Bond's own organization, right? Now, uh, it was a kind of, you know, uh, you like it, I trust, I mean, I hope, right? So, um, of course, it's a matter of fiction. Right, uh, and uh, all James Bond movies are matter of fiction. Uh, but imagine a situation, right? If you need to build such an organization which can serve any nation in this world as an you know outsourced intelligence agency. In that case, we do not need to, uh, raw. We do not need IB. We do not need CBI in India, or for that matter, the CIA uh, in, in in US or FBI in US. Uh, you, know, you know, there is no need for this. But imagine such a system, right? Imagine such an organization. How much does it entail to have that kind of intelligence? You know that in any, I mean, while we watch these spy thrillers and etc., right? We all know that it's not really a very easy thing, correct? I mean, when we go, if there is an you know, act of terrorism or something like that, ideally speaking, intelligence agencies are supposed to intercept, right? Often we can do, sometimes we do. Uh, we do not come to know as ordinary citizens uh, that how they have intercepted. Sometimes they fail to do that. In that case, it, of course, in that case, it come, comes to news. The bigger challenge is that I mean, the, the work of these intelligence organizations are absolutely, absolutely, you know, it's very difficult, right? So it's like, you know, it's like solving a puzzle, like any, you know, spy story, right? So you have a clue here, you have a clue there, you know, Creating a connection between these two, I mean, are often a very, very difficult task. So perhaps you know there was a small chat that happened between two different individuals, and then there might be a little bit of brawl in a particular, you know, drinking a bar or something like that, and maybe you know somewhere somebody you know said something, and maybe a little bit of piece of you know uh, text SMS or WhatsApp SMS, and you will have to build a story by connecting all these things together, right? Then only you know, okay, so you know what? It seems like there is an, you know, there is a possibility of attack in Paris, somewhere which is a crowded place, right? And it is supposed to be, you know, happening through some Middle Easterns, right? So Middle East, you know, somebody from Syria or somebody like that, right? Then you have to position your, you know, security forces and etc. Of course, I mean, there is an element of possibility, so it may fail, right? And if it, uh, you know, if it, is, if it doesn't happen in that case, that leads to a lot of bad presses, there are a lot of things. So you have to take a decision at some point of time whether to intercept or not to. Because if you intercept, you know that the normal citizen's life will be disrupted at that point of time. Possibly you'll be asked to evacuate a particular hall or a particular shopping mall or etc. Et so people do not take that very lightly, right? So it's a very, very difficult job. Now, is it possible for an individual to do that? Right? Of course not, right? We all know that. I mean, Sherlock Holmes and all these stories are very easy to read in, in uh, books or to watch in movies. But if you try to do it for yourself, you know that it's not possible to consume such monumental amount of information yourself. Correct? So you got to have a team. But even for the team, is it possible? Right? 
the every every day you know millions of you know text messages whatsapp messages or you know emails are being circulated just to not to talk about any other means of mechanism is it possible even for a team of very very bright you know individuals to process all this information it's not i'm not saying it's no but can we use a computer to do that answer is again no because computers are very good at you know doing uh, performing certain you know tasks which are given you know precise instructions way right but in case there is an element of you know ambiguity the facts and we all know in case of you know this kind of security intelligence it's always an element of ambiguity because you never know whether a thing will happen or not and all the different forms of information perhaps a text script perhaps a little bit of image somewhere perhaps a video analysis you know some piece of you know video clip or something like that to make some sense out of it it's very very difficult to be done by a computer so what's the answer right that's what we'll try to you know address in next maybe you know 40 minutes or so so there is something for public computing ladies and gentlemen i would like to introduce it so uh, what we we'll try to cover i mean this is a, a agenda but we'll little bit digress from there we'll talk about the evolution of public computing right and then we'll talk about what your organization needs to know right you know how our clients and our own organizations are trying to defend themselves and then what is the future right so where should we go so uh, before that uh, i will uh, i would like to show you another okay uh, so this is a movie uh, i'm pretty sure that many of you have not seen before okay uh, library computer district files subject phone number code for i'm very surprised that you put this institution After that background on actor Anton Karenin. So, so it's indeed Star Trek. Some of the you know very first installments uh, that we talk about the original series. Uh, we uh, they played it in 1960s, late 60s. I think 66 is the year when they published it and uh, you know broadcast it. In our childhood, of course, we watched it on you know, black and white television. You know, for, Dr. Shingokur and some other people have organized that, right? But we were, we were always thrilled about that. We can stop this now. We can, we were always thrilled about it. I was always, you know, uh, indeed very, very uh, surprised to see that how a man can, uh, forget this part. So can we? Uh, so how a man can speak to a machine or a computer, and computer can, you know, respond, right, in English or whatever, right? And in fact, you can see that Captain Kirk. is speaking to a computer right the computer on board computer of the air space ship uss enterprise right so in case uh, some i i heard somebody said that star trek so apparently some of your you know friends can recognize this one but in case you cannot you do not know about this series i am pretty sure that you have seen the latest installments of the movie is there anybody in this hall who doesn't know about star trek in that case i will spend half an hour 30 seconds on that okay good So you know that in Star Trek, of course, you know it's a futuristic thing. So human mankind has spread across different planets and etc. And they, you know, go through a spaceship or USS Enterprise, right? And they go from galaxy to galaxy, planet to planet, and then they adventure there, etc. Okay. So now, in Star Trek, even in 1960s, it's a science fiction, of course. I mean, they at that point of time, I mean, you can see that their captain car, their captain of the ship. right commander of the ship space ship he was speaking to the onboard computer computer was responding to it, correct so of course it was a matter of fiction at that point of time right and i was very thrilled because i always wanted to be a captain of a space ship i mean that uh, dream is not going to be fulfilled in this life right but uh, you know i was always thinking that okay can i have a computer with me i can speak and i can maybe i can tell them that i can do this do my home task right i can do it for right Uh, of course, it didn't happen. I had to do my own own task uh, uh, for myself, right? But it was a fiction, of course, 1960. Let us, you know, do a little bit of fast forward. Let us come to uh, another 50 years, you know, down the line, right? In 2011, let us watch this. We're going to uh, treat you to. Uh A short round of Jeopardy. It's going to be hosted by a member of our Jeopardy Clue Crew. Please welcome Jimmy McGuire. So it's a reality show called yeah. Jeopardy, which happens in today's television. Everybody, thank you for being here. What do you say we play so Jeopardy? Jeopardy? Sort of like Let's get right into the, right the Jeopardy round. The clues must have give some clue. These guys are the best. Contestants are supposed to answer. Chicks, dig me. 
children. Book titles, titles, My Michelle, MC5, and finally, vocabulary. Can you go to the first position? Please make a selection. Uh, I've never said this on so, TV. So, please don't be a bit. Do all the time I've done. Cassie's Kenyon's you know, excavation of this game. city mentioned yeah. Joshua yeah. Up, yeah. showed the walls and the car for the 17 times. That's it. What is Jericho? Correct. That's the computer. 400 That's the same computer category. Car, right? that we this mystery author and an archaeologist hugging dug in hopes of finding the lost Syrian city of Urkesh. Watson? Who is Agatha Christie? Correct. Same so, so you can look at that. Now, who is mostly speaking in English? And Watson, which is nothing but a computer that is, you know, responding in English, interacting in English, human language. Correct? So what we saw just before this particular movie, that was an element of you know fiction. That was a matter of fiction which was done in 1966. And in another 50 years or so, we have created a computer where people are speaking in English and they're responding to it. They are responding not only just you know chit chat, normal you know hi hello kind of thing, but they are essentially answering to questions which are given to them, right? And they get you know what? I mean they actually won it. The Watson actually won that particular game, right? And they he competed against two of two of the best you know players of you know Geopardy history. Okay, so 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 that's the that's the thing, right? So we always know that the fiction precedes the reality, right? So what had been the matter of imagination back in 1960s? It has become a matter of reality, right? In the 2011, in another 50 years of time. Okay, so that's how it went. Now, we, I, 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 I'm a big fan of uh, Haruki Murakami, a novelist, right? So, uh, famous Japanese novelist. But I am even better fan of this this particular book. And we all know about this. When giving our class tests or semester examinations, right? Knowledge is a social asset. Problem is that when we come to our examination paper, right? Then this knowledge doesn't happen, right? I always wish, I mean, can we have a collective knowledge, right? So we do not have to, we always try that at that point of time. I'm pretty sure you guys are more decent. So you always wanted to consult to have a collective, you know, uh, answer in a, during our examination. Of course, it was not allowed, <laughs> right? But we always thought so. But I mean, taking, I mean, um, on more serious matters, right? So it's always like that, right? Knowledge is very, very captive. The knowledge is very, very captive within our own mind. We know, all know that we are experts in certain area. We are not so expert in certain other areas, right? But uh, as it happens that nowadays, I mean, there is a convergence of need. So we always trigger, you know, we always think, okay, so can I have some mechanical knowledge, right? Just before this one, I think, uh, you know, the my, my previous speaker was talking about traffic management. As you can understand, it's the confluence of many different disciplines, right? So you got to know a little bit about city planning. He got to know a little bit about you know uh, uh, instrumentation. He got to know a little bit about data analytics and so on and so forth. Okay. Question is you know there is no sing single expert who can possess all this knowledge, right? So knowledge is always captive. It is not only captive within you know pages of book or examination paper or research papers or whatsoever. It is always kept also captive in certain other areas, for example, in human mind, right, or hard disk, right, or you know some website or something like that. Question is, you know, when you need this knowledge, how can you make it available, right? So that's the biggest challenge that you always face. Now we always tried that, right? So you always use computer. You guys know what Google means, right? So you often go and try to search it, try to find out certain information for which are useful to us, right? We always try. The challenge is that, I mean, both of these, I mean, this human and computer, their relationship has been tried and tested for quite long. But unfortunately, it fails up to it goes up to a limit. Then it fails up. Why is so? Because both these human and machines, I mean, they have certain limitations. And let us take a look at it. Like what are the limitations? Okay. So of course, I mean, we are very we human beings are the best intelligent, you know, uh, 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 creatures in this world. If I can use the term sentience, right? We are sentience. Mm -hmm. Problem is that I mean, we are we can only consume a limited amount of Right, and we always, you know, I mean, after a semester, I usually used to forget about those courses on this particular class, right? So, and I always try to consume the next one, right? Because I know that my brain power can consume only up to this particular thing. And there are a few other more interesting things, I mean, about the cricket, you know, statistics and etc., which of course I want to keep some part of my brain for that, right? So, it's, it's essentially I'm always like that. We can always consume a limited amount of information. Second one, I mean, we are prone to fatigue. 
right so we uh, you know uh, I, I may be a very good you know person to talk about certain thing but if i try to you know do that for next maybe say next uh, 6 hours or so i will you know make some mistakes i could be a very good driver but if i like you know drive for you know 24 hours at a stretch i am bound to you know uh, meet with an accident right because we we get we get fatigued right so we are uh, we get that right and then, of course, you know, we always have bias that is accept, right? So we always make mistakes. We our decisions always bias strong because we have our certain priorities. We know we like somebody, we may not like somebody based on that we give a decision. Okay. And look at the machine, right? So all these things that we are talking about are not a limitation for machine, right? The machine, I mean, the storage uh, price has been, uh, you know, brought down a lot, right? So the machine, I mean, the amount of information that they consume can be huge, right? Uh, so there is no limit, virtual, there is no virtual limit for it, right, at this period, okay? Then uh, another challenge is that the machine is very good at executing, you know, precise instructions. You all, uh, I'm pretty sure that you have done your own programming classes and etc. You know that whatever, you know, logic that you're building using your, you know, C, C++, Java, whatsoever, or Python for that matter, the machines, you know, without any complaint, I mean, they will execute those instructions. If you, you know, instruct them wrong, they will do wrong. If you instruct them right, I mean, they will do the right. They are not going to make any judgment, right? And if you program them for, say, I don't know, maybe say a plus b whole square formula, that if you expect them to, uh, you know, answer a square minus b square formula, they will fail to do that, right? So they are very rigid also. They are very precise, as instructed that they will always do, but whatever they are taught, they will only do that. They, they, will, they will do that perfectly, right? But they will only do that. If you expect them to do something else, they cannot do it, right? And another big challenge is that machines do not interact in natural ways, right? So if you want to interact with, I was trying to use my Mac before that, it didn't, you know, <laughs> understand my, uh, you know, you know, needs, right? And it failed to, you know, show the, you know, movies. Of course, it was doing very good on PowerPoint. But something I missed, right? So uh, machines do not understand, unfortunately. And, you know, by natural means, I mean like, you know, kind of speaking to English or speaking to Bangla or, then, you know, Hindi or whatever, right? And machines are supposed to understand it. It doesn't happen like that. Machines usually do not have a good vision. They do not recognize cases usually with some, you know, limitations, of course. Some things are to be done. So question is, you know, how do we bridge this gap between these two, two uh, words, right? The man and machine, right? So uh, looking at this kind of situation, right, you know, where you want to build an intelligence organization, a program which can, you know, stitch different pieces of information, picking them up from a huge pile of information, of course, right? How do they do that, right? So what to have a machine, right? Of course, machines are tireless. We got to have a tireless machine, right, which can learn a new problem domain as this. Uh, Okay, so it's not that you are okay, guys. I mean, so you are taught with a square plus b square, a square minus b square formula, and it cannot answer as a, a plus b whole square, right? So it's not that you should be able to cope up with a new problem domain, of course, within certain limitations, right? So that's something that is needed. Number two is that, I mean, for doing any sort of you know uh, reasoning, I mean, we human beings are very good at doing reasoning, right? So we know that, okay, so if uh, uh, Ram is a uh, son of Dashra and Ram's uh, own brother is uh, uh, Lakshman, then we know Lakshman's father is, you know, Dashra, right? So that's the reason, that's the reasoning logic. Unfortunately, machines do not, are not very good at doing that kind of thing, right? So can we have a reasoning things? I mean, it's a very simple reasoning logic, but can we build this kind of reasoning things with you, right? And then, can they evolve, right? Like a human expert, right? So when you go out of this college, I mean, of course, you, you know, try to uh, gather as much knowledge as possible within your own discipline. But when you get into industry and try to focus on one particular area, you try to gather yourself knowledge more on that. And then over the period of your, you, you become an expert on, this, on that particular topic. Okay? So, so what it means that you, your, your expertise on that particular area become more and more accurate, more and more, you know, useful, valuable. Can machines evolve like that? I mean, right now, no, but that's the machine that we need to have, right? And most importantly, can machines interact in natural means? Can they speak in human languages? Can they recognize faces? Can they listen to something and can interpret it, right? And can respond it, right? So all sorts of things. So that's exactly what we call cognitive computing, right? So it's a branch of artificial intelligence, as you can uh, see, right? But Three, I mean, uh, there is a there is a uh, dictionary definition that has been provided to you. 
But essentially, it is about three key, uh, you know, uh, characteristics. Uh, in IBM, that's exactly what we talk about, right? We call it U R L, right? So it's not unit. What is that called? Unit resource, whatever, whatever, right? right? But it is rather understanding, reasoning, and learning. Okay. So it got to understand whatever has been told to them. It got, it must have a reasoning capability, right? So that it can it can figure out that Lakshman's father is Lakshman, right? From other you know pieces of information. And then it got to have a capability of learning, right? Learning means it can evolve itself, it can brush up its knowledge, it can become more and more accurate, right? As it moves on. Okay. So in IBM, I mean, we talk about three patterns, three capabilities of uh, you know uh, of patterns or capabilities of cognitive computing. Okay? And there are many other points of view, but this is the point of view that we go with, with to the market. First one is about engagement. Okay. Why engagement? Because the machine and man, I mean, they will become, you know, more closer to each other. Okay, so the engagement, the, uh, the machines will be, they will be able to engage the human users in a better fashion. That's what we want. Decision made, decide. Okay, so we know that we take decisions, many decisions. Human beings take many decisions. There are even many uh, uh, machines also take decisions. I mean, we know about that. You always will give the else logics where human, sorry, machines take. Decisions. But that's the that's, that's the decision against a very very precise instruction. But we human beings always take decision in a very very ambiguous area, right? Where the you know, informations are not well known. You often do that if you drive a bike in Calcutta Road, you know what to do, right? So you uh, there is no machine who can drive a bike in Calcutta, right? So you need to know that when to turn, when not to turn, how much to turn, and blah blah blah, right? So that sort of things the machines cannot do. And how do we do that? I mean. There is no precise guideline rule book that you are following. Rather, based on your instinct, based on your knowledge, based on the driving skill that you have developed over the years, you take a decision that how much to run, how much not to run. Okay? When to fight, when not to fight. Okay? So can they, can machines do take similar kind of decisions or at least help human beings to recommend certain things in taking decisions in such kind of ambiguous areas? I will give some examples. Okay? Third one is about discovery. Right? We call it the epitome of the cognitive computing. So this is where the machines will go and discover new insights, which human beings are not being able to do right so far. We'll talk about that. We'll let us keep this one. So let us watch another. Okay. Tens of millions of us are diagnosed with cancer every year, and some eight million of us will die from the disease. Now imagine a world without cancer. Imagine. Imagine a world where every cancer patient gets high quality care that offers them the best chance for a cure. At MD Anderson, we're working hard to make that a reality. Expertise. The University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center has developed expertise in every type of cancer, from the most common to the most rare. Doctors here treat more than 100,000 cancer patients per year, making it the world's leading cancer hospital. But these cancer specialists can't treat everyone, only the patients who can travel to MD Anderson in Houston, Texas. To help many, many more patients, to improve cancer statistics, and to accelerate the end of this disease, We've created something new, MD Anderson's Oncology Expert Advisor. Most patients around the world do not have access to quality cancer care. Oncology Expert Advisor is our way of using technology to democratize our expertise so that we can benefit patients around the world. MD Anderson's Oncology Expert Advisor is powered by IBM's Watson. With its capability to understand human communication, Watson can learn and synthesize vast amounts of information. It also suggests appropriate therapy and care choices that are not just based on evidence, but are informed by the experience of experts. Knowledge. Conhecimento. With medical knowledge doubling every five years, no human can keep up with all of the books and journals published daily. We simply have too much information for any single doctor to absorb, especially with the genomic revolution in cancer. Cancer is a disease of the genome. We now have the ability to read that entire genome to know exactly what's caused that patient's cancer. And couple that knowledge on thousands of patient samples 
to the computer-based approaches that we have now, and you have a unique ability to really impact patient outcome, leveraging the basis of the disease. That's where the oncology expert advisor provides one of its greatest benefits. It can sort through millions of pages of data on behalf of the doctor to extract information that is most relevant to an individual patient so the doctor can make the best treatment and care decisions that are personalized to that patient. Now is the time. Now is the time to increase the life-saving impact of MD Anderson's clinical experts. All right, so uh, you got the message. So we all know about it. Cancer is a very, very difficult disease to treat. It's, it's not a single disease, right? So there could be many different reasons for how cancers could be organized. And every cancer patient requires a personalized treatment plan because every cancer patient is different, correct? And there is no single treatment for, you know, mechanism to treat a patient, correct? So there are some broad categories like, you know, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or surgery, these are the three tradi traditional, conventional ways of treating patients. But new new ways are coming up like genomics, treatment, and etc. Et correct? The challenge is that, I mean, if, if how to treat a cancer patient depends on many, many different kind of factors. We know that we are all very busy people, but we know the doctors are busier than us, right? Because they have more patients to treat than, you know, you know the number of patients, right? The problem is that, I mean, the doctors doesn't have time to go through all the different cases, trace all the different advancements of, you know, medical science and etc. So they try to always apply, you know, usual, based on their skill, they try to take some decision, and in most of the cases, they are sort of, you know, applying templatized treatment plan for a particular patient. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Challenge is the amount of information, that information availability is not a problem because a huge amount of information is already there. Lot of medical journal articles, lot of case history that has been built over the period of years. Problem is that most of this, you know, uh, data, most of the information are very difficult to be grasped by a single surgeon or a oncologist. So, if a computer can consume this, right, ingest this information, and can suggest some sort of treatment plans for a given particular patient's profile, that would have been really lovely. And that's exactly what we are trying to do to oncology advice, right? That's a community computing application. It's not taking a decision, but it is giving some recommendations to the doctors so that the doctors can take a decision based on that, okay? So that's an example of a decision making, the middle one. Now, let us talk about engagement, right? So, uh, I know that bragging is a crime right now, but when I, uh, you know, joined engineering school back in 91, it was still not a crime. And we went through our own share of, you know, ragging experiences. <coughs> so imagine the first day when you joined, the, when you went into the campus, right? So you, and if it's a big campus, right? You are often lost, right? So where to go, where to go, whom to speak to, where is my class, what are the formalities that needs to be filled in, and etc. Et back in 91, it was even more difficult. There was no Google, there was no internet, nothing. There is no mobile phone either. So uh, of course we tried to apply our own, you know, knowledge and own skills, our own network of people and etc. Et so we tried to navigate through that. But that dilemma lived with me for another four years till the end of you know, Indian college and possibly still living. Okay. So which class to take in my elective? What are the you know in campus? Which uh, you know interviews should I appear to? Should I, you know, go for GRE, GMAT, blah, 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 right? And it came a lot of lot of questions. Some of the answers were there in university, you know, manuals or now websites. Some of the information for which we had to uh, depend on our, you know, our seniors or our, you know, teachers, respective teachers to get their guidance and etc. Now imagine a situation, right, where you, there is a single, you know, place, maybe a website, maybe an app, where you can go, you can ask this question in English, and somebody answers all these things. In certain cases, it is a precise instruction. Maybe, okay, so the, here is my mechanical drawing class. Where do I go? I mean, this is a, just a number, the number is MR121, right? So I do not know, even know where to what is it. And maybe the computer, the, the app will give me an instruction, okay, take right, then uh, take another left. On the right hand side, there is a red building, which is mechanical engineering department. Go to the first ground floor, and then on the right hand side, your, your lab. Okay. And maybe, you know, okay, shall I take, you know, uh, 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 electrical machines in my electric? 
Oh, you are a computer science student, and maybe the next science will have electrical machining. But of course, if you are interested about you know, building electrical machines in future, maybe you may want to, right? So that's sort of recommendation. That's exactly what is happening in Deakin University of Australia. Okay, so that's where we have applied some public computing. People are coming, students, non-students, they can come, ask questions, and they can get an answer, all in English. Okay, discover. So for those who have, I don't know, uh, who will be doing their thesis papers at some point of time, you all know that at some point, you know, to, for your thesis work, for your research work, you need to do a hell lot of work, you know, reading, just to understand where to start your, you know, work, okay? For you call them to understand the state of the art, right? And for, for uh, modern sciences like computer science or electronics, or maybe you know, electronics is slightly older, uh, I mean, we have a, you know, of course, you know, the, the, there are a lot of, you know, publications, but that possibly that is slightly less than something more older like medical sciences, correct? Where they have a huge amount of I mean, uh, people have said, some studies said that every minute there is a new paper is being published, okay? I mean, some kind of new publication. <laughs> is it possible to know? I mean, to understand all these things? No, right? And, but imagine a situation, right? Uh, where a computer will help you to, you know, go through, they will go through it, I mean, the computer will go through the, all these you know, papers. They will understand and they will suggest, okay, so this is where you should start your research, right? In that case, imagine how much time it would save, right? So we did a similar kind of thing with Bella College of Medicine, University of Texas, right? So it's about a particular research project, I mean, which you always talk about. It's about a protein which is called P53, which is a pro tumor suppressor protein. Now, proteins could be switched on or switched off, right? And But there are many ways of doing it. Problem is that there is no single way, I mean, you can know. There are certain things which has already been tried, but in future we need to find out uh, even more you know, ways of doing it. Problem is that I mean, until 2003, 70,000 research papers have been published on P53 switching on and switching off. Okay? So imagine reading 70,000 research papers. For a single research year, it would take 38 years. So we are me. I will old, right? Forget about my research, just to understand. So what we did, we applied again complete computing over here. And it went through the 70,000 research articles and it gave us, you know, 10 different ideas to pursue in future, okay? Since we did it for 2000, till up to 2003, then we went and we tried to find out that, okay, out of this 10, how many has already been tried? So that we know that whatever has the recommendations are given to us, right, how accurate those, you know, recommendations are. And you know what? Out of this 10, 7 are already tried after 2003. So whatever recommendations are coming out of the computer, that's not going to be thrown away. So there is an element of you know, authenticity. So this is another example where we try to apply the discover capability of computer. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I would very quickly go through this and then possibly I will stop for uh, some question and answer, right? <coughs> so how would it evolve in future? Okay, so there are five things, I mean, there are five dimensions we believe that where community computing will be wrong, okay? First one is how interactive it is, okay? So does it understand that who are you, right? Does it understand your context, right? Maybe you are a fan of, you know, say, uh, F1 racing, Formula 1 racing, correct? Can it engage into a discussion which can bring in that kind of context? Because your friends always do that, right? Can a computer be like a friend who can understand you, who can engage into a discussion which attract you? So that's the personalized interaction we talk about, right? What is the degree of autonomy? So how many of you have working with machine learning or something like that in your final year or something? Do you have a paper on machine learning, data science? Okay, never mind. I'm pretty sure that in, in masters you'll have to do that. I mean, if you go to masters, right? So you know about it, right? So machine learning is essentially about you know to teach computers. I mean, on structured data primarily, but in non structured also it is happening nowadays. So we all know that to teach a machine, I mean, uh, you guys have heard about neural network, uh, k-means clustering, this sort of things, right? You have not. Okay. Maybe we will learn in a little. So in this kind of cases, you essentially you essentially teach your computer, right? So and then that the the, the, the uh, when you teach your computer, there are, uh, when computer learns, there are two ways it can happen, right? It's exactly for like the human beings. So in certain cases, you can remember when you were a kid, right? Your mother used to sit down with you and she used to take you through or your private tutor used to come or you, in your school, your you know, teachers used to sit down with you and you, you were given certain things, given certain tasks and etc. Then they used to correct you, right? And you are still going through that. 
that's a supervised learning. Somebody is supervising your learning process. If you are making a mistake, they are saying that this is a mistake, this is correct, this is not correct, so on and so forth. Correct? So that's the supervised learning. Second thing is that at some point of time, when uh, after a while you find that there is no teacher, because you know uh, you guys are you know, when you reach our age, I mean then you will understand that how important it is to have a teacher. Unfortunately, you do not get a teacher, right? So uh, in that case, the only thing that you could do is a self learn. So you go through a book, you try to do some tutorials yourself, or read something, something, right? In certain cases, it is very easy. In certain cases, it's not so easy, right? So you'll have to pick up the skill yourself. That's an unsupervised learning. Okay. In computer also it happens like that. There are cases where you need to teach computer, where you need to guide computer what is good, right, what is not right, right? So neural nets, uh, you know, class, some of the classification algorithms are like that. Then there are cases where computers can learn on its own. I mean Kevin's clustering is one such thing where computers can build a cluster on its own. Okay. So uh, unfortunately, most of the cases in public computing which where we are seeing industrial application, that is where supervised learning is necessary. But in future, we believe that more and more autonomy will be there in its learning process because that's where we need to go, right? And what are the various types of input that it can sense? I mean, it is doing fantastic work in English text. It is doing fantastic work on a few other languages. But in other languages like you know Bengali or Hindi, in future, I and mean, they will have to do even better, correct? And it's not just a text or language, right? They will have to understand, you know, vision. They will have to have, you know, listening capability, speech, right, and speaking capability, so on and so forth, correct? And uh, olfactory things, and you know, smells and etc. Right? We know it's a little bit more difficult because digitization is more complicated. But you know, it will pick up more and more vision and you know, speech capabilities in future or listening capability in future. How ubiquitous is this capability? Right. So where is it? I mean, is it captive within an app that is given to you, or a website, or something like that? Or if you, as I am speaking, I mean, somebody, a cognitive agent will be here, and he can help you. Have you watched Minority Report? Tom Cruise. Maybe it's one person. All right. Okay. So in Minority Report, I mean, I would have drawn an analogy over there, right? So there are there are some virtual agents which are living behind, you know, working with the. With the, with the spy, right, and he can take guidance from them. I mean, he is jogging, he is doing something, I mean, and at the same point of time, he can speak with through virtual reality and stuff like that, correct? So that's that's the future, right? So that's where we would like to go. So it will be ubiquitous, it will be there whenever we need it, right? Not in examination hall, right? And then, of course, the uh, scale, right? So because right now, I mean, we are only dealing with, uh, you know, some simple things, but in future, we'll have to go into more and more so guys, I mean, uh, this is where we are heading to, but uh, I'll skip some of the slides a little bit dry. But uh, have you heard of a gentleman called Alan Turing? Now I'll talk about him, where are we heading to? Alan Turing, you have heard, right? So you computer science analyst, you must have come to him. So uh, he was a brilliant mathematician. Have you watched that movie? Uh, you guys don't watch that movie, right? Yes. Imitation game, right? Yes. Who played uh, Alan Turing in that movie? What? Benedict Cumberbatch. So, do you watch Sherlock by any chance? Yes, yes, yes. Lovely. Okay. So, Sherlock doesn't need a, this thing. Uh, virtually, he is brilliant. <laughs> right, anyway. So, Alan Turing, right? So, Alan Turing was a brilliant mathematician, right? So, but Alan Turing at the same point of time, I mean, he is also a big philosopher, right? So, uh, he is sort of, you know, he is kind of the, uh, uh, sort of, you know, of the first few, you know, computer scientists who talked about artificial intelligence. But he also, you know, talked about, you know, a fantastic, he gave a fantastic quote, right, so about the future, right. So, you know, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plainly there that needs to be done, which is true, it cannot be truer than anywhere else in, you know, public computing. We have just scratched the surface, right, so there are many more things that are going to happen. Some of these things will happen in my lifetime, some of these things I will not be able to see, you will be able to see, right, in your lifetime, okay. But with all these advancements, that where are we heading? So that's a, that triggers a very very deep philosophical questions, guys. Right. So recently I was working with a with a customer who wanted to bring in humanoid robots in their banking operations. Right. So you know humanoid robots? You know about robots, I believe. Right. What is humanoid robots? Humanoid robots are robots, I mean machines, human like machines, but they look like humans. Right. So not a very specialized robotic arm which do you know assembly kind of thing, car assembly kind of thing. 
but a very generic, you know, uh, humanoid robot, like, you know, it looks like a human. So, uh, the, the thing is that, I mean, uh, one question that everybody was asking, right, that, how, what would be the relationship between a robot and a machine and a human being, right? So believe me guys, I mean, I have not worked with humanoid robots before, right? I mean, working with the, I mean, we, we, are, we are bringing this robot to do some kind of banking operations, right? Like, you know, you all do, you know, internet banking or mobile app banking, whatever, right? But the moment that you do this interaction with the robot, the whole interaction, I mean, the experience of the whole interaction changes, right? So the relationship between man and machine completely changes whenever a new form factor appears in front of us. We all know that Japanese people are culturally are, being, are more you know, accepting towards the robotic things, right? We Indians we do not know because we never have used robots okay, that much. So it's a question that everybody asks me at that point in time, that okay, so what do you think? That will, will this be a success, will this be a failure? My answer was that I do not know, right? Because we do not know that how Indians will interact with them. But it is definitely going to change something. There is no doubt. There. You recently saw a news article, right? HDFC is bringing in a robot, humanoid robot, one for the banking operation, correct? Uh, I was not talking about that bank, but there is another bank. HDFC has done a very little thing right now, but we are trying to do something deeper. But that's a different thing. I cannot disclose that. But. But the challenge is that, I mean, when we are talking about all this machine intelligence, etc., etc., artificial intelligence, etc., et right, we still know that, that you guys, I mean, is there anybody who is interested in photography? Anybody? Raise your hand. Nobody does photography? Even mobile photography? <laughs> okay, so, but we know that, I mean, the people who have a little bit of an understanding about the photographic, you know, equipment, we all know, even the most, you know, sophisticated camera, is far less capable than our human eye, right? The kind of contrast we can handle, the color depth that, that we can handle, no camera can handle that, right? So the same thing is true. I mean, we are making a lot of progress, but we are far behind than what is available to human you know, uh, uh, capabilities, right? But, you know, there are, there, of course, we are making a lot of advancements. I mean, as I mentioned, that in what was a real fiction 50 years back, now has become a reality, right? will make many, much more advanced things in the next few decades of course, right? But will this be, will these machines be ever be like a human being? Yeah. This movie, I mean, artificial intelligence, have you watched that? I mean, are you, I mean, this particular topic cannot be discussed uh, without talking about science fiction or movies, right? So, because this is pretty much more, a, a lot of concepts are picked up from there, right? So, it's a 2004 movie, uh, Stephen Spielberg movie, directed by Stephen Spielberg. If you guys have not seen this, you should watch it. It's a fantastic movie. It's not a normal, uh, you know, this thing, normal uh, science fiction movie. So this is about a humanoid robot again, right? So, but the robot, the difference of the robot is that it looks exactly like a human being, right? And it is programmed to laugh. Okay. Now there was a couple whose uh, son was uh, critically ill, and they are going through a depression. So they adopted a, a humanoid, you know, kid, right? And that kid, of course, you know, grow, was programmed to, you know, grow an attachment towards his adopted mother, right? And that attachment grew and grew. Of course, uh, his adopted father was not very fond of him. Then, at some point of time, their original son, their actual son, he would got freaked out, right? Then this machine, a, a emotional machine, that he has become redundant, okay? And then they discard it. Then, if you discard such a machine, in that case, of course, the only thing as per the law, they will have to destroy that. Then it's a little bit of you know adventure of this particular piece uh, of the machine, how he survived and etc. Then a lot of fast forward, right? The human race, you know, Homo sapiens is extinct from the world. Okay. Another ice age has come. Uh, the human uh, race has been replaced by a sort of silicon race, robots again, silicon uh, humanoid, but far more advanced than this particular, you know, kid. As they are, you know, archaeological uh, excavation process, they dig down a, you know, this humanoid kid who was in hibernation, and they, uh, you know, uh, bring him back, and just to watch, you know, just to study as for the research interest. Then this kid, you know, remembered all these things, and he uh, narrated this thing, and as a flashback, the story is told. Then, as his wish, I mean, they try to create his adopted mother from a strand of hair that this particular kid, you know, kept with him. 
and then uh, they resurrected the mother for a day because they cannot keep more than that, that's a limitation. The kids spend a day with mother for a whole day and by the end of the day, mother is going to be dead and the kid also going to stay and then they move to that place where dreams are born. So the key thing is that, I mean, would we ever have a machine who can love his adopted mother, who can dream? We do not. Uh, maybe uh, I don't think that in my lifetime it will be answered. Maybe in your lifetime it will be answered. Maybe in your kids, I do not know. But uh, that's something that future will answer. That will certainly. With that, I will take a pause, and if there is any question, I will take. Maybe you know. Okay, shall I take you know uh, 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 electrical machines in my electric? Oh, you are a computer science student, and maybe it doesn't make sense to have electrical machine. But of course, if you are interested about you know, building electrical machines in future, maybe you may want it, right? So that sort of recommendations. That's exactly what is happening in Deakin University of Australia. Okay, so that's where we have applied some cognitive computing. People are coming, students, non-students, they can come, ask questions, and they can get an answer, all in English. Okay, discover. So for those who have, I don't, uh, who will be doing their thesis papers at some point of time, you all know that at some point, you know, to, for your thesis work, for your research work, you need to do a hell lot of work, you know, reading, just to understand where to start your, you know, work, okay? For you to order to understand the state of the art, right? And for, for uh, modern sciences like computer science or electronics, or maybe you know, electronics is slightly older, uh, I mean, we have a, you know, of course, you know, the, there are a lot of, you know, publications, but that possibly that is slightly less than something more older like medical sciences, correct? They have a huge amount of I mean, uh, people have said, some studies said that every minute there is a new paper is being published, okay? And some kind of new publication. <laughs> is it possible to know? I mean, to understand all these things? No, right? And, but imagine a situation, right? Uh, where a computer will help you to, you know, go through, they will go through it, I mean, the computer will go through the, all these you know, papers, they will understand and they will suggest, okay, so this is where you should start your research, right? In that case, imagine how much time it would save, right? So we did a similar kind of thing with Bellow College of Medicine, University of Texas, right? So it's about a particular research project, I mean, which you always talk about. It's about a protein which is called P53, which is a pro tumor suppressor protein. Now, proteins could be switched on or switched off, right? And But there are many ways of doing it. Problem is that there is no single way, I mean, you can know. There are certain things which has already been tried, but in future we need to find out uh, even more you know, ways of doing Problem is that I mean, until 2003, 70,000 research papers have been published on P53 switching on and switching off. Okay? So imagine reading 70,000 research papers. For a single research year, it would take 38 years. Don't be at me. I will hold, right? Forget about my research, just to understand. So what we did, we applied again continuing computing over here, and it went through the 70,000 research articles, and it gave us, you know, 10 different ideas to pursue in future. Okay. Since we did it for 2000 till up to 2003, then we went and we tried to find out that okay, out of this 10, how many has already been tried, so that we know that whatever has the recommendations are given to us, right? How accurate those you know recommendations are, and you know what? Out of this 10, 7 are already tried after 2003. So whatever recommendations are coming out of the computer, that's not going to be thrown away. So there is an element of you know, authenticity. So this is another example where we try to apply the discover capability of cognitive computing. So um, I, I would very quickly go through this and then possibly I will stop for uh, some question and answer. right? So how would it evolve in future? Okay, so there are five things, I mean there are five dimensions we believe that where community computing will be born. Okay. First one is how interactive it is. Okay. So does it understand that who are you, right? Does it understand your context, right? Maybe you are a fan of you know say uh, F1 risk, Formula One risk, correct? Can it engage into a discussion which can bring in that kind of context? Because your friends always do that, right? Can a computer be like a friend who can understand you, who can engage into a discussion? which attract, so that's the personalized interaction we talk about, right? What is the degree of autonomy? So how many of you have working with machine learning or something like that in your final year or something? Do you have a paper on machine learning, data science? 
Okay, never mind. I'm pretty sure that in, in masters you have to do that. I mean, if you go to masters, right? So you know about it, right? So machine learning is essentially about you know to teach computers. I mean, on structured data primarily, but in non-structured also is happening nowadays. So we all know that to teach a machine, I mean, uh, you guys have heard about neural network, k uh, rings clustering, this sort of things, right? You have not. Okay, maybe we will learn in your later. So in this kind of cases, you essentially you essentially teach your computer, right? So and then the the the, 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 the when you teach your computer, there are the, when computer learns, there are two ways it can happen, right? It's exactly for like the human beings. So in certain cases, you can remember when you were a kid, right? Your mother used to sit down with you and she used to take you through, or your private tutor used to come, or you, in your school, your you know teachers used to sit down with you and you you were given certain things, given certain tasks and etc. Then they used to correct you, right? And you are still going through that. That's a supervised learning. Somebody is supervising your learning process. If you are making a mistake, they are saying okay, this is a mistake, this is correct, this is not correct, so on and so forth. Correct? So that's the supervised learning. Second thing is that at some point of time, when uh, after a while you find that there is no teacher, because you know uh, you guys are, you know, when you reach our age, I mean then you will understand that how important it is to have a teacher. Unfortunately, you do not get a teacher, right? So uh, in that case, the only thing that you could do is a self learning So you go through a book, you try to do some tutorials yourself or read something, something, right? In certain cases it is very easy, in certain cases it's not so easy, right? So you'll have to pick up the skill yourself. That's an unsupervised learning, okay? In computer also it happens like that. There are cases where you need to teach computer, where you need to guide computer what is good, right, what is not right, right? So neural nets, uh, you know, some of the classification algorithms are like that. Then there are cases where computers can learn on its own. I mean, Kevin's clustering is one such thing where computers can build a cluster on its own. Okay? So, unfortunately, most of the cases in public computing, which where we are seeing industrial application, that is where supervised learning is necessary. But in future, we believe that more and more autonomy will be there in its learning process because that's where we need to go, right? And what are the various types of input that it can sense? I mean, it is doing fantastic work in English text, it is doing fantastic work on a few other languages, but in other languages like you know Bengali or Hindi in future, and they will have to do even better, correct? And it's not just a text or language, right? They will have to understand you know vision, they will have to have you know listening capability, speech, right, and speaking capability, so on and so forth, correct? And uh, olfactory things and you know smells and etc. Well, we know it's a little bit more difficult because digitization is more complex. But you know, it will pick up more and more vision and you know speech capabilities in future or listening capability in future. How ubiquitous is this capability? Right? So where is it? I mean, is it captive within an app that is given to you or a website or something like that? Or if you as I'm speaking, I mean somebody, a company agent will be here and he can help you. Have you watched minority report? Tom Cruise? You guys don't watch me. Right, okay. So in minority report, I mean, I would have drawn an analogy over there, right? So there are there are some virtual agents which are living behind, you know, working with the with the, with the spy, right? And he can take guidance from them. I mean, he is jogging, he is doing something. I mean, and at the same point of time, he can speak with through virtual reality and stuff, like that, correct? So that's that's the future, right? So that's where we would like to go. So it will be ubiquitous. It will be there whenever we need it, right? Not in examination hall, right? And then of course the uh, scale. Right, so because right now, I mean, we are only dealing with uh, you know some simple things, but in future we we'll have to go into more and more complex things. So, guys, I mean, uh, this is where we are heading to, but uh, let's keep some of these slides a little bit dry. But uh, have you heard of a gentleman called Alan Turing? Now I talk about you know, where are we heading? To? Alan Turing, you have heard, right? So, in your computer science, I'm the master, you must have come here. So, uh, he was a brilliant mathematician. Have you watched that movie? Uh, you guys don't watch that. Right? Yes. Imitation game, right? Yeah. Who, who played uh, Alan Turing in that movie? What? Benedict Cumberbatch. So do you watch Sherlock by any chance? Yes. 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 Lovely. Okay. So Sherlock doesn't need a, this thing. Uh, virtually, he is brilliant. <laughs> right, anyway. So Alan Turing, right? So Alan Turing was a brilliant mathematician, right? So but Alan Turing at the same point of time, I mean, he is also a big philosopher, right? So uh, he is sort of, you know, he is kind of the uh, uh, sort of, you know, of the first few, you know, computer scientists who talked about artificial intelligence. 
but he also you know talked about you know a fantastic he gave a fantastic quote right so about the future right so you know we can always see a short distance ahead but we can see plainly there that needs to be done which is true it cannot be truer than anywhere else and you know public computer we have just scratched the surface right so there are many more things that are going to happen some of these things will happen in my lifetime some of these things i will not be able to see when you will be able to see right in your life okay but with all these advancements that where are we heading so that's a, that triggers a very very deep philosophical questions guys right so recently i was working with a with a customer who wanted to bring in humanoid robots in their banking operations right so you know humanoid robots you know about robots i believe right what is humanoid robots humanoid robots are robots some I mean machines human like machines but they look like human right so not a very specialized robotic arm which do you know assembly kind of thing car assembly kind of thing but a very generic you know uh, humanoid robot like you know it looks like a human uh, the the thing is that i mean uh, one question that everybody was asking right that how what will be the relationship between a robot and a machine and a human being correct right? so believe me guys i mean i have not worked with humanoid robots before right i mean working with them, i mean we we are we are bringing this robot to do some kind of banking operations right like you know you all do you know internet banking or mobile app banking whatever right but the moment that you do this interaction with the robot the whole interaction i mean the experience of the whole interaction changes right so the relationship between man and machine I mean, completely changes whenever a new form factor appears in front of us we all know that japanese people are culturally are being are more you know accepting towards the robotic things right we indians we do not know because we never have used robots okay that much so it's a question that everybody asks me at that point in time that okay so what do you think that will, will this be a success will this be a failure my answer was that i do not know right because we do not know that how indians will interact with them but it is definitely going to change something there is no doubt there. you recently saw a news article right hdfc is bringing in a robot in an robot one for the banking operation correct right? uh, i was not talking about that bank but there is another bank hdfc has done a very little thing right now but we are trying to do something deeper but that's a different thing i should not disclose that <laughs> but but the challenge is that i mean when we are talking about all this machine intelligence etc etc artificial intelligence etc et right we still know that when you guys i mean is there anybody who is interested in photography anybody raise your hand nobody does photography even mobile photography <laughs> okay so but we know that i mean the people who has a little bit of understanding about the photography you know equipment so we all know even the most you know sophisticated camera is far less capable than our human eye right the kind of contrast we can handle the color depth that that we can handle no camera can handle that, right so the same thing is true i mean we are making a lot of progress but we are far behind than what is available to a human you know uh, uh, capabilities right but you know there are there of course we are making a lot of advancements i mean as i mentioned that in what was a real of fiction 50 years back now has become a reality right will make may much more advanced next in the next few decades of course right but will this be will this machines be ever be like a human being yeah, this movie i mean artificial intelligence have you watched that i mean are you i mean this particular topic cannot be discussed uh, without talking about science fiction or movies, right so because this is pretty much more a lot of concepts are picked up from there right so it's a 2004 movie uh, stephen spielberg movie directed by stephen spielberg if you guys have not seen this you should watch it it's a fantastic movie it's not a normal uh, you know this thing normal uh, science fiction movie so this is about a humanoid robot again right so but the robot the difference of the robot is that it looks exactly like a human being right and it is programmed to laugh okay now there was a couple whose uh, son was uh, critically ill and they are going through a depression so they adopted a, a humanoid you know kid right and that kid of course you know bro was programmed to you know grow an attachment towards his adopted mother right and that attachment grew and grew of course so his adopted father was not very fond of him then at some point of time their original son their actual son he would got free grow right then this machine a a emotional machine that he has become redundant okay and then they discarded 
then if you discard such a machine, in that case, of course, the only thing as per the law, they will have to destroy that machine. Then it's a little bit of you know adventure of this particular piece uh, of the machine, how he survived and etc. Then a lot of first of right? The human race, you know, Homo sapiens is extinct from the world. Okay. And the ice age has come. Uh, the human uh, race has been replaced by a sort of silicon race, robots again, silicon uh, humanoid. But far more advanced than this particular, you know, cave. As they are, you know, archaeological uh, excavation process, they dig down a, you know, this humanoid kid who was in hibernation, and they, uh, you know, uh, bring him back, and just to watch, you know, just to study as for the research interest. Then this kid, you know, remembered all these things and he uh, narrated this thing, and that's flashback the story story. Then, as his wish, I mean, they tried to create his adopted mother. From a strand of hair that this particular kid, you know, kept with him, and then uh, they resurrected the mother for a day because they cannot keep more than that. That's a limitation. The kid spent a day with mother for a whole day, and by the end of the day, mother is going to be dead, and the kid also going to stay. And then they move to that place where dreams are born. So the key thing is that I mean, do we ever have a machine who can? Love his adopted mother, who can dream. We do not. Uh, maybe uh, I don't think that in my lifetime it will be answered. Maybe in your lifetime it will be answered. Maybe in your kids, I don't know. But uh, that's something that future will answer. That will certainly. With that, I will take a pause, and if there is any question, I will take. Uh, any question from the audience? Guys, watch movies, okay? Moral of the story. <laughs> Anything you ask? Uh -huh. uh, shown us how the cognitive computing is going to change the industry's landscape now and in the near future. Now I would request Professor Indranil Shemshir Mukdo, I take from IT Kharagpur, to felicitate Dr. Shankar. Uh, basically, Professor Shengupta is our advisor and he is the next speaker too.